getting started. Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. Uh, how are you all? Hey. Hi. <laughs> Jacqueline Marie. It's Jackie. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. Hi. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. How are you? It's a crazy time. Jean Marc, how you doing? Yeah. So so. I can't hear you, Jean Marc. You're on mute. Say again. How's how's that? Yeah, right. good. Good. Okay. I was, I was just uh, feeling a little sad. Mm. Yep. Yeah, man. <laughs> no joke. Sad times. Um, is there anything that, in terms of like, uh, I'm trying to think of something to say in terms of introduction. You know, just feels crazy. Is there anything that you think uh, needs to be mentioned? I mean, feel free, by the way, I mean, to use this moment, you know, if you want to, if there's something that you want to say to, to this, this is going to be archived, you know, um, it's going to stream on Facebook Live, you know, if there's a, if there's something that, if there's just a, something you want to say, I mean, feel free, that's all I'm saying. All right, Maureen. Whoa. You're muted. I can unmute you. See that, Maureen? I just sent a. No, I just I. <laughs> Here, I'm unmuting you. Unmute. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> um. That's so, uh, Aaron, yes, I will, I will make you a host. I'm also making, um, uh, um, Sarah, Sarah Warren will also be a co-host. Okay. Um, so you can handle that together. Oh, right now we're recording. I'm going to pause the recording. <laughs> all right. I'm going to let them all in. All right. We're recording. Then. So Tom, can I still ask a question? Uh, well, if you want everybody to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know about, like, when uh, you'll, you'll flip us over into screen sharing as we go from- No, no, you'll, you'll have to share your own screen. But, so the, okay. Um, and, then you'll t and then you'll shut it off when you're ready. If we have any technical difficulties, we'll work through it. Okay. People are pretty, um, uh, you know. Hi, everybody. Are we all here? Hi, Derek. Nice to see your face. <laughs> You're hearing my voice for the first time. That's right. I am. <laughs> Good. Um, let me just make sure that I've got. Uh, we are going live on Facebook now. Um, and we are live. Okay, everybody. Um, so hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, today's panel discussion uh, features uh, two artists and one collective uh, who are working on installations for a show called Owning Earth, um, which uh, um, uh, will open at Unison Arts in New Paltz, New York um, in September of 2020. So this is a uh, uh, so the event today uh, is called On Visibility and Restoration, and it's part of a series of panel discussions with the artists in the show. Um, in two weeks, on June 14th, um, we will have art for, we'll have a, a, a panel called Art for Non-Humans, um, and it'll feature the work of Michael Aspill and Derek Stroop, Eleanor King and Lucy Pullen, and Sarah Max Beck. So two, two uh, collaborative works and one individual work. Um, 
So we hope you can join us for that as well. And thank you for coming today. And I want to start today with a little bit of uh, gratitude. Um, uh, I want to first uh, express some gratitude to the great team at Unison Arts. Um, so that's, uh, that's Alex Baer, Alexis Agnew, Ali Bell, Rob Leitner, and Francis Wu. Um, you guys are amazing. You've been really supportive of the project and the arts in general. And I have to say, like, these are not um, uh, tough. These are not easy times for arts organizations. Um, arts organizations are, you know, uh, particularly vulnerable to economic disruptions of all kind and the current um, economic uh, disruption is severe. Um, arts organizations are also called upon to be uh, 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 to assist in economic recovery and so they're kind of in a very strange place um, and uh, Unison has done an amazing job, has done so much with so little. Um, their live-ish programs online are really fantastic and I hope you take uh, a close look at those. There's um, uh, and I encourage you all to give uh, to Unison Arts today. There's a, a link, a donate please link there on, in the chat that Sarah Warren just posted. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, again, uh, the arts are critical to near and long-term recovery uh, and uh, they support social cohesion and resilience and, um, and also sometimes provide direct services. So they're really crucial and I hope that you can support with what you got. Um, I also want to express some gratitude to uh, the sculpture committee at Unison Arts that includes Sarah Warren, Matthew Friday, uh, Michael Aspill, Eliza Evans, and, and, um, um, and who did I miss? Uh, oh, and Karali uh, Pizzoli, who is, um, they've been amazing and supportive throughout this entire process. Um, and, uh, and, Lastly, but possibly more, most importantly today, uh, I want to express some gratitude to uh, the movement for Black Lives um, and everyone out on the streets today uh, and yesterday and the day before. Um, these are crazy times, you know, um, and, uh, and it's a time for us to all be standing up against exactly what we saw um, happen to George Floyd. And, uh, and I have to say that a few of our panelists today have expressed um, that, uh, that the current events are kind of making it harder for them to think <laughs> today. To, uh, there's just a lot going on. And uh, I really want to thank them for being here with us today and to thank all of you for being with us here today. These are, these are um, really challenging times. And, and, and the show in general, Owning Earth, um, really what it's asking artists to do in a broad way is um, consider what a post-domination future might look like, um, what post-domination culture is. Um, and in a sense, I really do hope that the kinds of work that we support in this show might uh, help us in the process towards building a world where um, what we saw happen to George Floyd just can never happen. Where the institutions that are um, entirely uh, uh, just um, based in domination and, um, and violence, where they might be overturned and, and replaced with something kinder, more generous, um, more humane. Um, and I hope that our panelists today have a chance to, in, in discussing their work, have a chance to describe how their work um, uh, intersects with these particular issues. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, let's get started. So again, Owning Earth is, a, is an ambitious two-year outdoor sculptural exhibition. It brings together an emerging movement of artists um, whose land-based uh, uh, works question and undermine notions of control. There are 20 artists in the show, um, and, uh, and uh, the panel today features th uh, two artists and one collective. Um, uh, the artists in uh, this panel are all distinguished by the ways in which uh, their work uh, uh, examines and uh, um, uh, examines and even perhaps heals deep-seated injustices 
Um, and in some sense, this is the perfect group of artists to be uh, speaking today. Um, so we're going to start off with Jackie Summel, um, followed by uh, followed by How to Perform an Abortion, uh, which will be represented by Maureen Connor and uh, Landon Newton. And we'll end with uh, Jean-Marc superville Sovac. At the end of their presentations, we'll have an open Q&A. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so let's let's begin. Uh, Jackie Summel is uh, is really kind of groundbreaking, uh, uh, multidisciplinary artist and um, abolitionist, inspired most by the lives of everyday people. Her work has been successfully anchored in the intersection of activism and education, um, and mindfulness practices and art for nearly two decades, and has been exhibited extensively throughout the world. She's been the recipient of multiple residencies and fellowships. Um, including uh, a Source Fellowship, a Blade of Grass, Robert Rauschenberg, Artists as Activist Fellow, a, jo a Soros Justice Fellow Fellowship, an I-Beam Fellowship, a Headlands Residency. Um, she's currently a Creative Capital Fellow. Um, uh, Summel's collaboration with Herman Wallace, who's a prisoner of consciousness and member of the Angola Three, uh, was the subject of an Emmy Award-winning documentary, Herman's House. Um, Summel's work with Herman is positioned at the forefront of the national campaign to end solitary confinement and seek humane alternatives to incarceration. Um, so I'd love to thank uh, Jackie for being with us today. Take it away, Jackie. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. I'm gonna just put on a shared screen here. Um, Make sure y'all can see it. Can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. um, and if you guys are willing, um, I know that, you know, we are in relationship to the essence of time and we've been asked to keep our presentation short and I will speak much more quickly in describing my work. Um, but I would like to start off with just a, a very short meditation um, to bring us together. Um, if you feel comfortable and if you feel safe, I invite you to close your eyes. If it's possible and you're able-bodied to place your feet on the floor. And with your eyes closed, just take, take a moment to recognize your breath. To notice it. To remember it like you are remembering a sweet old friend, a beloved. And to organize gratitude around that breath, that beloved. As a source of nourishment, of life, of transmutation, of change. And to honor that this breath was taken from George Floyd and Tony McDade and Breonna Taylor. And that we as human beings and human doings must use our breath, our creativity, our imagination, our adaptability to shift and change systems of punishment and control that have caused so much harm and hurt. And to also believe and trust that we have within us what it takes to create a new system that makes the existing system obsolete. And if there is any job of the artist, I believe that is it. Take that breath one more time together, draw it in through your nose. And when you reach the chop, the top of that breath, just hold on to it, hold on in that pause. And then let's open our mouths and just let it go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was 
very intense for me. I, thanks. I'm continuing to anchor, you know, any presentation, my talk and gratitude. These are my elders, Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, Robert, Robert King, uh, collectively known as the Angola Three, as Tal mentioned. All of my personal and political orientation is because of their great tutelage, their patience, and their love. I cannot have these conversations. I would not have these conversations without the intersection of those qualities. Um, as Tal mentioned, they are Black Panthers, revolutionaries who spent um, upwards of four decades in solitary confinement and isolation in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day. Um, in a prison called Angola here in the state of Louisiana. And just a little bit of context, um, Angola prison is the largest prison, 18,000 acres in the colonized United States. Um, it's a former slave plantation that was named for the place in Africa where they believe the most profitable slaves came from. As many know, Louisiana, the state of Louisiana was made fat literally and figuratively on the backs of enslaved people um, through uh, the forced labor of chattel crops, sugarcane, cotton, tobacco. Sugarcane being the most violent, the Mississippi River was lined with cane fields. Um, and in the 1800s, a man named Isaac Franklin colonized this land, recognizing that there was profit to be made in repopulating those cane fields. Um, with enslaved bodies that were bred in Angola. Um, and in 2020, Angola maintains a predominantly black population, 6,000 able-bodied prisoners who were forced to work the same fields, cane, cotton, soybeans, 18,000 acres for two to 20 cents an hour, a minimum of 40 hours a week. Um, and my orientation and understanding of this is because of a man named Herman Wallace, who spent 41 years in Angola in a six foot by nine foot cell in solitary confinement or what they call CCR, closed cell restriction. Um, and I had the great honor and privilege of collaborating with Herman for 12 years, um, designing his dream home as an artist, really um, celebrating and um, making public the uh, strength of his incredible resilience and imagination. Um, so this is an image of Herman's house. As I said, we had 12 years of, of, of designing it. This is a CAD image. Um, you know, the intention is to actually physically build his house. But the way that we were able to do it while Herman was in isolation was through letter writing. Um, and so literally hundreds, you know, thousands of letters um, that were shared and the letters became phone calls, the phone calls became visits. Um, and 15, 19, oh my God, I can't keep track. 19 years later, here I am living in the state of Louisiana because of Herman. Um, I moved here to be closer to him in 2005. Um, so this is just an image of some of the letters from a recent exhibition. And I share that because they um, inform the work that I do now. Um, and they also provided an incredible archive um, of our relationship. You know, it was very few, it's an antiquated process of, of communication as letter writing. Um, and um, important uh, illustrations that came through this communication or conversation, Herman would often describe his cell. Um, and it became my job as an artist and as his comrade um, to translate, oops, those drawings. And so I started um, this project asking him what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell for then 29 years dream of. Um, and, then, um, and then translating his dreams um, next to, or juxtaposing his dream next to his reality. So you can see the cell here and then different iterations of Herman's um, dream home. Um, and again, that was a 12 year process. As many of you know, on October 1st, 2013, Herman Wallace's conviction was overturned and he was released from prison. Um, he joined the ancestors three days later, October 4th, 2013, um, suffering from the advanced stages of liver cancer. 
Um, as you could imagine, I was um, beyond devastated. As I said, I, I live in Louisiana because of Herman Wallace. Um, and I was incredibly disoriented by that loss and that grief, as were many. <laughs> um, and I was very lucky to have those letters and to revisit them. And when I revisited those letters, I recognized for the first time how much Herman Wallace mentioned gardens and mentioned plants and mentioned the land and mentioned these things that he was denied access for or access to for 41 years. In fact, in the very first letter, when I asked him what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell for 29 years dream of, he said, I can clearly see the gardens and I wish for guests to be able to walk through gardens and smile all year round. The second thing he asked for was a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a large black panther in the center. So, you know, he had his priorities straight. Um, and so I knew that there was in the wake of losing Herman or transitioning Herman, um, I knew that there was um, something to gardens and gardening that would inform the ability to uphold his life and his legacy. Um, and then nothing shy of a download. Um, almost two years later, I started a project with a mutual friend of Tal and I, Imani Jacqueline Brown, called the Solitary Gardens. I'm going to skip over this slide. And so the Solitary Gardens use that exact same cell um, as the blueprint for a garden bed that is then co-created with folks who are in isolation, folks that are in solitary confinement. Um, and you can see here one of those garden beds, the only place that human beings can plant or we can grow on behalf of, of human beings who are still in isolation is in the spaces where they can move. Um, and we do this again through written exchanges. So we're using this process of letter writing to become proxies for folks who are condemned to the worst of our humanity, just isolation and solitary confinement. These are different garden beds. They're in different places around the country. Um, this is an image of, in, of some of the first iterations of the solitary gardens in New Orleans. And in some ways you can see they become portraits of the human beings who are buried deepest within our carceral institutions. Um, written into the tenets of the solitary gardens uh, or the principles of abolition, um, this belief that we can exist in a landscape without prisons. And so it's necessary that these prison cells turn garden beds disappear over time so that somewhere in our consciousness, we believe that is possible. We believe we can live without prisons um, and the need to punish. And then we are transmuting, transferring that energy into something far more beautiful. In this image, you can see Victoria's working with one of the garden beds in the background is the sugar cane. We've been growing cotton and tobacco on site. And then we develop this practice um, that I call revolutionary mortar as a nod to Herman Albert and Robert, where we mix that with a non hydraulic lime, um, a natural substance, and then through this rammed earth process. We have the newest iteration of the garden beds. So we're taking these prison cells, turn garden beds, and then building them out of sugarcane, cotton, tobacco, the largest chattel slave crops, illustrating the evolution of chattel slavery into mass incarceration. Um, and so, as I said, this has been a, a, a very um, powerful and meaningful process that has traveled. There's garden beds in New York, in Philly, in Rhode Island, in Texas, um, in California. Um, and, and these images are, are exclusive to um, what I consider an, a, a park, an abolition park here in Louisiana, the solitary gardens. Um, and one of the big questions comes up is that comes up is like what's happening with all of the food and the and the herbs and the things that you're growing inside those garden beds, the things that are chosen by folks who are incarcerated. Um, and some of it goes back to the families um, of the incarcerated person. Some of it goes to the neighborhood. Um, the garden beds that were at the Lower East Side Girls Club in New York and Philly um, grew flowers on behalf of incarcerated um, mothers, so moms that were serving life sentences, LWAPs, without the possibility of parole. And then they harvested those flowers and made bouquets that they gave to the mamas on the Philly, on the bailout, mama's bailout day. Um, and, and then um, the newest iteration of the solitary gardens, which is relative to owning earth, 
is that we're collaborating um, to design plant medicine with the plants that are grown inside these garden beds. Um, and that plant medicine is part of a larger project called the Prisoner's Apothecary. Um, and so the idea is that there's now 10 different um, incarcerated individuals who are going through herbal school through proxy relationships and then designing garden beds that will then heal the communities they were once accused of harming mm, as a gesture of abolition. Um, and that process is facilitated also through letter writing, um, garden bed design, et cetera. And what I think is important and relative to the context of today is this is one image of the apothecary um, and, and, and the folks that we're working with are designing mutual aid medicine kits for the protesters um, and things that will help with anxiety. A lot of folks are suffering from sore throats, from screaming, um, things to help folks sustain like nutritive herbs and tea blends to help sustain the long haul that's ahead of us. Um, and, and, um, and medicine to help with our nervous systems. Um, so it becomes this shared practice of gardening, of dreaming, um, and imagining a landscape without prisons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, and also thanks again for that meditation. Mm -hmm. That was, that was uh, really meaningful. Um, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Um, so uh, Maureen Connor um, and uh, Landon Newton and Eugenia Manuelian are working on a project called How to Perform an Abortion. Um, I'll introduce both uh, Maureen and Landon. Um, Eugenia won't be here with us today. Um, Maureen Connor has been working uh, in New York as an artist and educator since 1970. Um, her collaborative projects have focused on the human relationships um, with the, on human relationships and social change for more than 20 years. Um, internationally, she's been recognized for her feminist work from the 80s and 90s um, and today. And she's received grants from the Guggenheim, the NEA, NIFA, and Anonymous was a woman among others. She's the, um, she's the co-founder of the Reproductive Justice Collaborative, How to Perform an Abortion. Um, and they recently created uh, Reproductive Justice Garden and Waiting Room, which is, which is ongoing on the SUNY Purchase campus. Um, her podcast, Shouldn't We Talk, launching in, summer, in the summer of 2020, features interviews and discussions about uh, uh, the beginning of the end of patriarchy. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Maureen for, um, for, uh, a few, for you know, well, I haven't worked with you recently very closely, Maureen, but... Um, in, in and around the wake of Occupy Wall Street, Maureen and I had um, some good, good times working together. I'm really glad that she can be here for this. Uh, Landon Newton, um, uh, she, her, is a Brooklyn-based artist and gardener. Um, she's interested in the relationships between plants and people. Her current research-driven practice explores the history of herbal medicine, uh, specifically the use of plants and herbs for birth control and abortion. Uh, um, she's participated in the Eco Futures, Deep Trash, and Queer Feminist Eco Criticism Conference in uh, London, uh, Open Engagement, Sustainable, uh, and, um, and has uh, featured uh, the Abortion Herb Garden at the Queen's Museum um, in Queens, New York. Um, in 2018, she was a visiting artist fellow at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and has held residencies at uh, uh, the studios at Mass MoCA. Um, and elsewhere studi studios in Colorado. She has a bachelor's from Smith College and an MFA from uh, uh, the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and has studied horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, so I wanna thank Maureen and Landon for being here with us. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Tal, for that introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see, not that part of my screen. Okay, um, first I'd like to just say thank you uh, to Jackie both for a really inspiring uh, meditation and also talk. And 
uh, to say that she's been a great inspiration to our project. Uh, I had the good fortune of visiting her New Orleans uh, gardens in 2018. And uh, this was, you know, a few years ago, we were just trying to uh, get our feet wet with the abortion gardens. And uh, yeah, she was super generous and helpful. And um, anyway, the, great. Thank you, Jackie, for your support and for your great work. So, um, so our project, How to Perform an Abortion, is an intergenerational art collective aimed at shifting culture and law in favor of reproductive justice. We do this by planting gardens of herbs that have been used for abortion and contraception throughout human history and creating spaces and workshops that present materials to explain this history and to make the point that abortion has existed for millennia and will continue to as long as people get pregnant. The seed for this collective, pardon the expression, was first planted uh, when I was researching a project for Columbia, South Carolina in 2015 as part of another collective, which is called the Institute for Wishful Thinking. And at the time discovered a monument to Dr. J. Marion Sims, a doctor in the antebellum 19th century South. And that's what we're looking at now. We're looking at, a, at Dr. Sims' monument he had, he has a monument, still has a monument in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, but I subsequently found out that he, he had one in New York. Can you um, see the shared screen? Can people see it? Oh, not yet. You can't see it? Mm -mm. Oh, oh dear. Sorry. Whoops. <laughs> Okay. I think we all, I think these days we all have to be, uh, uh, you know, kind when it comes to technology. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you see the share screen on the bottom here? Yeah, I do. Okay. I thought I did that, but um, then I have to, okay. We've all made that same mistake. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for stopping me. Uh, okay. Okay, can you see it now? Okay, great. Yes. Okay. So anyway, here's Dr. Sims' uh, monument in Central Park, uh, which was there until 2018. Um, anyway, Sims, as many of you probably know, has become known as the father of gynecology, but he actually exploited antebellum enslaved women for his medical research. Dr. Sims was part of a cohort of antebellum doctors in the 19th century who created medical careers and public reputations by helping to make enslaved women more fertile. The purpose was, of course, to increase their birth rate and therefore produce more manpower for Southern landowners. Research on Sims led me to understand that many modern gynecological practices grew out of the work of these 19th century doctors and that their racist and misogynist attitudes uh, continue to influence medicine to this day. Uh, I also discovered, after discovering that there was a monument to Sims in New York, that there had been calls for the removal of Sims, mo Sims monument in New York since 2007. Around the time that Trump was elected, I asked Eugenia Manuelian, who, you know, unfortunately isn't with us today, because she's doing childcare, um, if she wanted to work with me to research the history of women's health. Uh, to go back as far in history as we could to see if we could discover where, how the knowledge and understanding of the reproductive process developed. And, and ask, was it always as oppressive as it is now? We talked about making a film, but there was really no particular goal other than, um, than to just see where the research took us. Uh, 
As we began to uncover the ancient histories of abortion and contraception, knowledge about the uh, use of herbs for abortion uh, and knowledge, uh, contraception and knowledge about the use of herbs for abortion, what was most surprising about our research was the discovery that abortions were not illegal in many cultures up to quickening or about the fourth month of pregnancy when uh, fetal movement begins. People actually in that, within that four month period in earlier times took herbs to bring back the menses as they called it before anyone even knew they were pregnant. Then in 2017, there was a march in Charlottesville, Virginia that was connected to Confederate monuments there. And uh, subsequently, uh, whoops, sorry. Subsequently, uh, Sims Monument, where there were a lot of demands uh, across the country to take many monuments down, but Sims Monument was removed the following year in 2018. Uh, so during the first few years, Eugenia and I presented research-based installations and gatherings um, with the aim to demystify abortion by sharing our um, by sharing our knowledge about the historical, biological, and ethical controversies that surround it and continue to. We presented our work in the form of abortion gardens, which showcase these plants um, in a variety of ways to manage fertility, and abortion clinic waiting rooms, which reimagined clinic waiting rooms as spaces for healing and learning. Our installations include lectures or interactive workshops, and we also distribute abortion kits, which in include charts of reproductive processes, reproductions of historical artifacts, excerpts from Roe v. Wade, seeds to plant, and even samples of salve to prepare the body for abortion that we also made from herbs. Our gardens mostly were planted by ourselves and workshop attendees. Um, and it's, it's really, just as a side note, interesting to um, find out that our work now overlaps in a, in a more direct way with Jackie's work in, in terms of her kits for, um, for protesters uh, to, to keep them safe and healthy. So uh, uh, it's an, it's, that's another inspiration, Jackie. Um, so let's see, meanwhile, sorry. In, in this, uh, <clears throat> let's see, in the spring of, of uh, 2019, we're invited to design and plant an abortion garden and installation at SUNY Purchase by artists and curators, Eleanor King, who will be speaking next, uh, next the next meeting, who's in o Owning Earth and Rachel Owens for their exhibition titled As of Right. Uh, in 2018, Eugenia and I had discovered Land and Newton's work. She had been working for several years on a related project we admired, and we decided to ask her to join our team for the purchase project. So just before I pass it to Landon, uh, this slide is an image of the garden area that we selected before uh, before we began planting. Um, and this is a sign that we made uh, with all of the different plants, uh, abortion and contraceptive herbs that we planted in, in these garden patches, which you can see little snippets of on the right. Um, I'm gonna now pass to Landon, who's gonna talk a little bit about her work and then tell us some more about our plants for Unison. Um, so one thing we pictured here, and could we, if we could go to the slide before, is that um, while we were designing and creating this garden with the help of students and faculty at SUNY, um, we discovered that there was mugwort growing in the planting area that we chose for our abortion herb garden. And mugwort is an abortive fashion. Um, it's also considered a noxious weed um, throughout New York State and other states. 
um, and we decided to incorporate that little patch of mugwort into our garden. Um, and that sort of idea of this thing popping up and growing in a space that we were um, we were given to plant a garden gave us this idea for uh, what we wanted to do for owning earth. Um, and yeah, my, my work coincides, I was really focused specifically on uh, historical uh, knowledge surrounding abortifacients um, and the use of these herbs um, and how that information was sort of passed generationally. This is a photo of a herb cart that I made um, that has plants, um, abortifacient plants in it, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Um, those are all, all also abortifacient plants. Um, and uh, there were packets involved and a little library uh, for further reading. Um, so uh, going back to the, the discovery of the mugwort, um, uh, phase one of our project at Unison will be the establishment of an abortion herb garden as a scattered, scattered site garden in which we'll identify and label abortifacient plants that are already growing wild on the property. Phase two will be the building, growing, and activation of the abortion monument, which will be delineated by plants and signs, objects, and serve as a pavilion and gathering site. The scattered abortion herb garden signs and plants will be used to create a map to the unison grounds, culminating at the abortion monument or pavilion. We're considering other elements as a part of phase two, including workshops or gatherings, co-led by experts with medical, legal, and abortion expertise, who will discuss specific aspects of abortion laws, ethics, and practices. We're also thinking of new ways of incorporating our research and text-based work into our outdoor sculpture. Both garden and monument are designed to convey the simple truth that abortion is a universal human phenomenon even as its forms change over time, depending on place, belief, and systems of power. And that's about it. Uh, hopefully our, the images give you a sense of, of some of the text-based work, or some of the uh, text-based work that we do and, and have already done. And not that they represent the signage that will exist in unison, but just to give you a sense of how our, our work uh, exists in relation to the information that we try to communicate. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much. And, and you know, one of the things, and you may have mentioned it, but uh, one of the things that I think is so wonderful about your project is that um, you are uh, also focused on um, sharing this work very particularly with healthcare providers um, and uh, and see them as a primary audience of the project rather than rather than having this project exist primarily in arts spaces um, they're meant to be you know shared in um, in health settings um, and uh, and I, you know when you were creating your waiting room what was so exciting in terms of an of, of a what was so exciting to me about your project was that you were really thinking of your art as a healing practice, um, providing pro uh, what, what kind of, what kind of artwork do you create for women who are having a really Im immense or making, making a very difficult choice, um, and, uh, and are, uh, potentially undergoing, uh, a challenging physical process and emotional process. Um, do you want to speak to that at all? I mean, have you, what, what, um, uh, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't mention that. Um, let's see, do I unchair? Oh, showing me you slides I didn't actually plan to show. Um, yeah, I think that the idea of the waiting room was, um, for me, I see it as creating a, an alternative future or alternative reality where an abortion clinic waiting room is um, an easily accessible space, a space that's um, nice to be in, that has plants, that has information about abortion, um, that has a childcare um, area that is sort of 
yeah, this reimagining of what that type of support could be. Um, and then the idea for the kits would be to provide these distributable kits um, with this information, history of abortion, um, medical abortion, herbal abortion, um, to provide for free to abortion clinics to be able to mm -hmm. be on display um, to just sort of change what that experience is or what that space is. Um, and I think that's one, you know, that's one aspect of, of the work and what are other ways that we can sort of make these interventions to normalize the history of abortion, to uh, point to different histories or different futures where it's something that's, um, that's accessible, that's supported. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Landon. Um, our next speaker uh, is Jean-Marc superville -Sovac. Um uh, Jean-Marc is a multidisciplinary artist whose work uh, deeply involves the community around him. Um, among an array of public art projects, Jean-Marc has built and toured a tiny house of steel, um, staged a neighborhood portrait drawing as, drawing as oral history storefront, constructed a brick wall with a, um, with a built-in hole, produced videos of his doppelgangers and given guided tours of New York City housing projects, um, his work has been exhibited at the Samuel Dorsky Museum, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, Socrates Sculpture Park, Manifesta 8 European Biennial, um, and he's also the illustrator of uh, several award-winning novels by Julie Chibarro. Uh, uh, Chib Is that how you say it? Is that how I... <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, he lives and works with Julie uh, in Beacon, New York. Um, Jean-Marc, uh, uh, you've also recently been doing YouTube uh, or not YouTube, uh, like, like, like short, short videos. Um, and they're really engaging. And I encourage, where do you post them? Do you post them on YouTube or on Instagram or something? Um, I, 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 it would be nice if you shared that with uh, the folks here too, because it, it's been really lovely. They're like one minute long and they're really fun. And they're, and they're about your work. Um, they're like minute long artist talks. Um, and I've been really appreciating them, so. Anyway, I'm very glad you're here with us today. Thank you, Jean-Marc. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, does that work? Am I on? I'm on, okay. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Tal, for the introduction. Thanks, uh, everyone, for um, uh, joining um, the meeting. And then also, I just wanted to extend a deep appreciation for these uh, incredibly accomplished artists that I've come to know now through these panels and through this uh, congregation somehow virtually. I, I know that um, this was not uh, the way it was intended to happen. Um, but um, I want to be also very honest and um, speak from a place of uh, deep uh, paralysis uh, for me right now, which is uh, sort of a little, it's a little intimidating to see you know, these, these in, in, incredible uh, bodies of, of, of work. So I just want to put that out as a, as a caveat in the sense that um, uh, r right now I, I, uh, I, I, I feel sort of a, um, um, uh, uh, an impotence that's, that's, all, <laughs> that's almost unbearable. So maybe as a, I'll just throw that out as a sort of tease for a conversation that we could sort of develop uh, now, later, whenever, it's just sort of a question of like, how is it possible to um, uh, actually to quote uh, Thoreau, what does he say? What signifies the beauty of nature when men or humans are, are so base? Um, and it's sort of the, the baseness is sort of what, uh, what I'm, I'm feeling right now. So with that, I'll, um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully make that work. Um, can everyone just give me, Tal, just give me an okay if uh, this is working. Yeah? All right. It is. So, uh, the tiny house uh, in, in which I am sitting right now is a project that was essentially focused on a mortgage-free based home ownership program is sort of the way I like to um, um, put it since then things have uh, evolved and it's a little harrowing to think of 
um, what Jackie was speaking of in terms of what uh, living in a in a in a confined um, uh, space, uh, not of one's choosing, um, um, represents. But in in this case, um, a willful experiment to uh, determine the conditions of of one's living space, especially since. Um, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this. It's very difficult to try and um, convince a, a bank to um, uh, give you money um, in, a, in a being a, um, uh, an artist, or at least in an art, art, artistic practice. Um, but um, this is as far as uh, this has gotten. Uh, you can see the, the tiny stove there in the, in the, in the background. So I just want to set the this is this is this is where I'm at. This is where I'm sitting. Um, this is right right now. Um, I've been working on right now a, a sense of landscape that's uh, maybe less uh, physical and more um, virtual or historical. Mostly focusing on um, prints, 19th century prints. These ones uh, in particular published um, um, in uh, 19 uh, 18. Uh, 30, uh, 6, 37, all, all, all throughout uh, the 19th century. And they were the um, more popularized version, I would say, of the, I guess, what's, what's popularly called the uh, Hudson River School. So these vistas, these um, 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 in, in intensely uh, idealized uh, landscapes of um, uh, and around uh, the, the Hudson River, everywhere from um, uh, uh, New York City up to West Point, up to Saratoga Lake, Niagara Falls. I mean, these were considered uh, part of the American picturesque. That was a term that was um, bandied around um, at the time. And the question I asked myself uh, was, well, what else was being published at uh, this um, uh, um, very fertile moment of of uh, um, of the uh, uh, appreciation for the American landscape. Um, at the time, um, there were um, uh, uh, numerous uh, pu publications uh, by um, society, anti-slavery societies, uh, Quaker um, um, uh, uh, paraphernalia uh, literature, and um, those were also illustrated. Um, so I like to refer to these as, you know, artists who were clearly also down with the cause and um, who lent their, uh, their, their, their practice, their skill to um, something that was also part of the American uh, landscape. Um, so where the, I guess where I come in is the intersection of these two images, in a sense, the the the, the most recent edition of these prints include images from these anti-slavery almanacs and uh, abolitionist uh, literature, and they're superimposed on some of these um, landscapes. In this particular case, um, this uh, apprehension of uh, um, um, a, 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 a freedom seeker or a, a fugitive slave was taken from um, a publication by abolitionist Abel Thomas uh, titled Gospel of Slavery. Um, it's kind of a strange uh, children's book almost with uh, like an ABC um, and uh, in this case K stands for kidnapper. This was the illustration that accompanied it. Um, they're not all images of the subjugation of black bodies. Um, some of them include um, uh, images of caravans of, um, of, of fugitives, um, in this case, uh, an illustration that was uh, taken from uh, the accounts of uh, a fellow named William Still, who wrote um, uh, his account of the uh, Undergr Underground Railroad, uh, a, a fugitive uh, himself. Um, uh, that is um, William Still um, publication um, uh, itself. Um, if, in case you're wondering um, how, how is this even done um, through the magic of uh, technology, uh, the digital file can be uh, reproduced as a printing plate. Uh, it's done. I'll shout out uh, Boxcar Press as a company. And also um, the uh, first experiments of this happened in uh, uh, Poughkeepsie 
um, in uh, a Falk Hill uh, Creative Works in a place called the uh, formerly known or is still known as the Underwear Factory, um, uh, where I met uh, Emily Hussard, who's also um, participating in uh, the Owning, Owning Earth um, show. So shout out to uh, Emily and um, the whole team for uh, um, an incredible amount of uh, technical help for something that I had never um, really done before. I didn't really even know if um, it could be done. Um, trying to stick to the seven minutes here. Um, the community that I'm in is also part of and a product of the work that I do. Um, this uh, a project back in 2016 was called I Draw, You Talk. Um, there were a series of interviews um, in which uh, I invited uh, bystanders, uh, goers by, passers by, um, and um, anyone who wanted to step into the gallery um, uh, for a, a portrait, in exchange for the portrait, I would record an interview. The portrait was hung on uh, the, uh, the walls of the gallery and the visitors were invited to pick up their portraits at the end of the show. Uh, 109 uh, portraits uh, later, um, this was the, 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 the product of it in the sense that um, I was mostly interested in finding a way in which people could uh, express themselves uh, um, in, in a, in a, in a, on a, on a, on a platform other than, than, uh, just, uh, online. Um, and so there was a, a sandwich border and if you can really see it in the, in the slide, in which, uh, there was a, a, a poll question, uh, yes or no question that was posed, uh, each day in order to sort of draw people. And that was, uh, the subject of the conversation during which, uh, the portrait was drawn, uh, some more portraits. Um, living in the Hudson Valley, uh, it's inevitable that you end up, I think, uh, 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 around, perhaps on um, the river. And being on the river, I think it's inevitable that you also discover um, the, the, the history of uh, what was the biggest uh, brick production um, the earth has ever really seen. The Hudson Valley being uh, a giant glacial clay bed uh, from which uh, anybody really could um, uh, 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 establish a, a, a brickyard. Um, those brickyards, a lot of them are still around. And the bricks um, that I uh, chose to use uh, as a medium were bricks that uh, happened to have the word empire, New York meaning the empire state, uh, uh, stamped uh, into the face of them. Um, this led to this uh, sort of um, map making um, a, a project uh, to sort of um, create an image of what that, that empire um, could look like. Um, this was at the Aldrich uh, Contemporary Museum in uh, Connecticut. Um, the bricks which uh, made that map were previously uh, used at uh, Socrates uh, Sculpture Park. Uh, if anyone's interested in um, uh, a, a really uh, um, well-organized um, gig uh, to create outdoor uh, sculpture that uh, I would highly um, recommend. And this is the wall that Tal was walking about, uh, talking about, the wall that has no um, sort of um, um, function um, to separate, but other uh, actually functions more as like this, this porous um, 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 membrane that um, Socrates Sculpture Park being a, a New York City park is um, is um, um, open to um, um, everyone, and um, the sculpture itself has uh, sort of ex exposed itself to that to that um, pub public nature. Um, the bricks were a thing for a while. Um, I was really obsessed with uh, the history of not only the the bricks themselves, but the people who made the bricks. And the history of that brick making also happens to coincide with the uh, history of uh, uh, migrant workforces um, from um, Europe and also um, from the South. There were a lot of black faces, obviously you can see in um, those brickyards. And uh, my uh, uh, tour um, or my, my uh, performance, if you want to call it that, was focused on um, telling the story of uh, Stuyvesant Town uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Ed Woodham, uh, who uh, does every year, I think he still does, Art in Odd Places along 14th Street. Uh, and this was focused on Stuyvesant Town, which is all the way at the end of 14th Street, if you've ever been, um, if you've been uh, down there, uh, the Soviet style 
um, um, brick structures um, where uh, I, I, I wanted to um, share this story of uh, black brickyard workers who could have been making bricks for a uh, structure that they themselves would not have been able to live in, Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant Town being um, constructed and intended at the time as a, a segregated workforce. I realize I'm going way over the seven minutes. So I'm just gonna skip past here and talk about a project that um, recently um, has been um, on display on 23rd Street uh, in New York City, a series of drawings based on lynching postcards. If you don't know what lynching postcards are, I recommend this book, uh, Without Sanctuary. Don't read the book unless you in <laughs> intend to, to, to actually uh, deeply um, look at it because it's, it's very, very hard to look at. And um, what, what uh, ended up being the, the process uh, for me in, in, in order to, to, to really look at these images was to create these portraits of the uh, lynching crowds without uh, the lynched uh, bodies to observe the, the, the possibility of, of this, this um, occurrence um, actually ever, ever happening. So um, with that, um, I'm just going to uh, slowly drift off um, and um, hopefully um, glean um, from you a sense of the, uh, the possibility of actually making um, some sort of um, 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 meaningful uh, a, a, a gesture um, with this with this exhibition um, um, uh, in in the uh, in the environment and in the um, in the political atmosphere that we're in because I don't have an answer I have I have no I have I have nothing um, so with that I'll I'll pass it back over to you so thank you uh, everyone for for listening in. Thank you so much, Sean Mark. And you know, I have to say that I just I appreciate all of you so much for your authenticity and your and your honesty. Um, we need that right now. And I, you know, I think that's a great question that you posed. I mean, I guess it was Thoreau's question, but <laughs> great. It's a it's a it's a really good good guiding question. Um, and thank you all uh, for making such courageous work. Um, each of you, each of your projects that you that you uh, presented today is um, uh, really uh, something that I that you know something that I aspire to myself as an artist. Um, and you're all really inspiring, inspirational practitioners. Um, we're going to open it up now to questions. Um, for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Um, you can ask a question by posting it on the comments. Um, if you're on uh, the uh, if you're on the Zoom, you can either raise your hand um, or you can post your question in the chat. Um, so uh, uh, if you want, I'll just leave some space open for that. Let me know. Let me know if you uh, if you have a question for one of our panelists. Sarah Warren, looks like. Hi. By, by raise your hand, I mean, uh, there's actually a- Yeah, uh, I you, know. I just that. <laughs> <laughs> <You> can, <laughs> all right, go ahead. <laughs> um, I also, I was looking for the Facebook Live so I could read the, any questions on it, but for some reason I can't find it right now. But I've, I've got it open. You got Sorry. it, okay, yeah. good. Um, so this is a question I think for any of you, um, of the artist, but I, I am going to direct it mostly at Jackie. And um, I'm real, I just w hope that you could say more about the, what I saw as a transition between the original um, solitary gardens and these, um, and now the, the prisoners apothecary. And it seems like it's a transition, one of the things that's shifting is that you go from a more symbolic set of actions where the, the sugar cane, the tobacco and the cotton, right? Like they're, they're symbols of the history and, and the labor and the toxic in many different ways, um, character of those things. Um, and then with the prisoner's apothecary, it's 
it's not that there is no symbolic value, but you've moved into a sort of concrete relation where you're using, you know, medicinal substances that have a direct, that are meant to have a direct effect on an individual. And I, I was hoping you could talk about how you saw that shift or thought about it. I mean, <clears throat> thank you for that question. I'm, I'm not sure that I see my shifts. I mean, one of the great gifts that I got from Herman Albert, Robert, Walimu, like my elders is really, you know, that you point yourself in the direction you believe is right. Um, and you cast your sails and you allow yourself to move in others, you know, um, with the best intentions. And so for me, it's, and, and I think, you know, there was that quote from Emma Goldman that human laws are invalid because they don't obey the laws of nature. And, you know, it's really from the plants and from nature that I also learned um, that you listen more than you dictate. And so there was no real intention to shift, but it's kind of funny that you, I mean, yes, there's poetics in the idea of illustrating the evolution of chattel slavery by building a prison cell with these crops, but also there's concrete in it. So it is kind of concrete in and of itself, right? You know, it's like it's this thing, but it's alive. Um, and sometimes, you know, in a, when you're, when I'm given more time to talk about it, there's, I have images of like the cane breaking through these prison cells turned garden beds. And that also is like incredibly poetic and literal. Um, and it's like the ancestors coming back and destroying prisons, you know, dismantling them. Thank you. Working with gardens is is tough, in general, um, especially when it when when uh, in a in a fine art context. Um, you know, I, I, Jackie, I know that you've got experience with that, but maybe I'll direct this to Maureen and Landon. How has working with plants um, affected your ability to in, to engage with fine arts institutions? Um, have you, uh, uh, have you found it easy? Have you found it difficult? Um, and, and what has been the, like, what's been, a, what's been the benefit for you, um, of working with plants? I really appreciate Jackie, the way that you said that, uh, working with plants has forced you to listen. Um, and, uh, I can't, can't imagine that's not true for you as well, Maureen Landon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, so much of that is that plants plants are a material that you work with um, that have their own ideas and structures of how they operate. Um, they're not going to function exactly how you want them to function. Um, and part of that is being open and flexible and, and, under, and learning a new system. Um, one project that we planted um, you know, we have seasons and when we plant a project and we want something to look full or look like it's been growing, um, depending on the time of year we plant, it's not gonna look like that. Um, and there are also things that have a different, live on a different timeline than I think a lot of like project-based works, non-plant timeline-based works. Um, so they grow over time, they die over time. Um, plants will sort of migrate over time. Um, and I think that plants as a medium teach you a lot about um, being flexible to change in that way. Well, also I feel like um, trying to find a balance between you know, object making or design and the plants themselves, you know, whether it's in the space of the garden itself or uh, in other, you know, with, uh, like spaces that are in relation to the garden, like our waiting room. Uh, it's, it's, it's really still a learning process for me, I think, you know, how, how do these two parts you know, one which is like rather formal and even though, 
even though the waiting room is meant to be functional, um, ideally it would be a waiting room, uh, a real waiting room for an abortion clinic. It wouldn't be in a gallery. And, <clears throat> and I, I feel like that that's the one thing that we haven't really been able to do, um, fortunately to help brought it up and Landon spoke to it you know, the, the idea of working with abortion clinics and working with uh, people who are having abortions. And, and in terms of institutions, you know, you, you call your project how to perform an abortion and people are kind of like, oh, <laughs> maybe no thank you. Uh, you know, so, um, and then abortion clinics or abortion related organizations might feel more comfortable, but at the same time, they <clears throat> they worry about their funding too. So um, I'm still I still want to see what kind of impact impact the plants can have uh, within the context of, of people who are about to have an abortion or in relationship to uh, the actual experience of having an abortion. That's something we we still want to see. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we don't have any other questions currently. Um, and I can keep asking questions. Um, uh, Jean-Marc, you, uh, you aren't working with plants currently, but you are working with a particularly um, extractive, or you have in the past worked with a particularly extractive industry, uh, uh, brick making in the Hudson Valley. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, 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 what's your, how, how has your project evolved to address extraction generally? Um, I know that you, uh, that in inscribing, um, in inscribing uh, uh, the history of uh, abolition and slavery into, um, into these Hudson, Hudson River school um, uh, prints, you've found a way to almost to re address a different kind of extraction, a kind of aesthetic extraction that, or, or erasure really. Um, and yeah, I'm just wondering how those two projects might be related and, um, and yeah, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I, I wonder how they might be related too. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, even though the evidence of the history of brick making is nothing but the detritus of that industry today. There's, there's nothing left. There's one brickyard left in, in Kingston that's structurally, you can, I mean, I, sh uh, I showed a, one image of it that still, you know, has, has evidence um, of it. Um, but the clay is still there. That's what's uh, astonishing is that um, I, uh, I drove around, uh, there was a development, um, a lot of these sort of um, um, multi-home multi sort of uh, uh, dwellings that, that, that have been uh, constructed along, uh, along the Hudson River. And um, I asked uh, um, one, of, one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the front load driver there, I, I said, do, you, do you encounter a lot of clay? And he said, we don't know what to do with the clay. There's, there's just, it's literally everywhere. And um, I took that opportunity to actually uh, have him dump some um, in my, uh, my pickup truck. And um, so I have Hudson Valley clay sitting <laughs> um, that I've been moving around from one studio to the next. Um, uh, pr probably not, um, um, not not a, 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 a totally efficient use of, of my time, but um, I find that ge geologically speaking, there are things that are indigenous, if I can use the word, to um, the area that are um, still deeply um, significant. And um, I don't know what I'm going to do with this this clay, and if it has um, you know, promise for a project or not, but um, just inherently knowing that that same material is pr is is present in 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 um, in, uh, in in my in my backyard is somehow valuable. That answers the question. Yeah, sure. Um, and I 
I guess uh, in the absence of any other questions, I mean, I kind of have a sense that uh, that just in general, the vibe of this uh, panel has been uh, a little more subdued than the other ones we've had so far. And I think for very good reason, um, uh, we're facing tremendous challenges as a culture. Um, and uh, uh, the murder of uh, yet another human at the hands of a white cop is uh, um, uh, pretty nasty stuff. Uh, it's very hard for me personally to um, process it. And um, although I have to say, Jackie, uh, your meditation in the beginning was extraordinarily helpful. Um, uh, coming at it from the breath is beautiful. I'm wondering if, uh, if anyone on the call would like to say, ha has, has something that they'd like to say, are artists or not. I mean, maybe this is a space that we can uh, open for that, at least for a moment before we say goodbye. Robert wanted to say something, I think. I was just trying to unmute myself. <laughs> well, the uh, the title of the ex exhibition, Owning Earth, uh, raises, it's like swimming in my head and, uh, you know, in terms of what that really means, ownership, uh, or, or to belong. And I think that uh, the garden, the idea of the garden is uh, at unison or just the sculpture garden or the idea of a garden is uh, so powerful. And uh, I'm uh, really interested in trying to, to use that, that energy and, and how other artists and, uh, will use the energy to, uh, to maybe not to own, but to understand how we can uh, move forward in, 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 in a way that is, uh, surpasses the concept of ownership. And I would love to hear any thoughts about that from anyone. Well, I always felt that the title is one that questions itself. You know, it, it should have a kind of feel like it should have a question mark after it. Uh, owning Earth, you know, that, that it's, it's a question about who owns Earth and does anybody. You know, so uh, it's kind of, to me, it's a, it's a really rhetorical title. And, um, and also the way Tal has framed it in his um, call for projects uh, really gives it like a deep history and, um, you know, and, and a critique of the whole notion of owning. Yes, indeed. Uh, Derek, this, uh, you'll be the last. And then I, I'd like to ask uh, if it's possible for uh, Jackie uh, to lead us in a kind of a closing meditation. Um, Can you say one, one more quick thing before we go? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. do, you'll say something. Oh, how about Derek, you can say something, Sarah, and then, um, and then we'll close it off with uh, another brief kind of closing meditation. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, ownership as we're together today and already together we're creating something that none of us own, which is the quality of this conversation conversation, even just the quality of listening and attention that we share with each other. And I think that's really already something that is already present in the project is this quality of a shared thing, even this Zoom call such as it is. And I just really, that interests me so much more, more and more. Thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I'm, you know, I chair the sculpture garden committee or the sculpture committee at Unison. And so, you know, it was, I was the one who 
kind of coerced Eliza and um, Michael and Matthew Friday, and Eliza and Michael, Eliza Evans and Michael Osbill, who are on the call right now, to, to come together and, and start thinking, you know, like, what is it we're going to do with this space? Um, what can we do that, you know, will make us feel like we're actually contributing something? Um, and at the time, you know, I thought it was a big leap for me to put so much effort and time into it. And, um, and I've at many times, many times I've <laughs> tried to step away from it, but I'm, you know, especially now when it's, there are so many other pressing things that seem immediate, like I'm going to walk out the door after this is done and I'm going to go to a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, but I've never felt more humbled and grateful to have all these people, all of you, you know, contributing and giving your, um, your spirit. And I, I know this word is so strange, but genius, I feel like you're contributing your genius to this. And I'm just, I'm just so humbled and grateful. And thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Well, Jackie, if, uh, if you would really appreciate it, if you could lead us in a closing meditation. Um, I want to again, before, before that, just to say again, another thank you. Thank you for all of you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, and um, see you in two weeks at our next panel, but maybe also see you on the streets. Sure. If y'all are ready, it's the same offering, um, just to find a way to settle your body. Generally, it's to connect your feet to the ground, to the land. And if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. And the invitation is to rest your attention once again on your breath, that great gift of respiration. Mm -hmm. A mutual friend of many of ours, Gibran Rivera, often says that, you know, when we breathe, we inspire. As we inhale, we respire. As we exhale, and when we do it together, we conspire. <laughs> and so let's conspire and continue to conspire together, breathing in. Reaching the top and pausing. And then breathing out. And again, like that, breathe in. Reach the top and cherish that pause. Hold on to your breath as if holding on to the thoughts, words, and actions of the past. And then open the mouth and let go of it. Let it go. And last one together breathing in fully and completely reaching the top and holding on to it feeling the tension of grasping you might even say holding owning believing in ownership and then the relief of letting that go exhaling together <laughs> You can hear the sirens in my background calling us all to get to the streets and support the brothers and sisters, our loved ones, our beloveds, our land. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Jackie, for that wonderful meditation. Um, and uh, please be in touch. You can always reach me at owningearth at gmail.com or you can, um, uh, and, and by the way, uh, uh, if you are watching now and want to participate somehow in the show, uh, there's always uh, opportunities to donate your labor or materials to the artists who are doing this work. Um, really appreciate all of you. 
Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.